Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. Find out more about what NSTA has to offer at nsta.org. This episode of Lab Out Loud is sponsored by the 3M Young Scientist Challenge. The 3M Young Scientists Challenge invites students in grades 5 through 8 to compete for an exclusive mentorship with a 3M scientist and a $25,000 grand prize. Enter at youngscientistlab.com until April 26th. Start today! You're listening to Lab Out Loud, Science for the Classroom, and beyond. And our guest today is here to help us understand how we research learning. I mean, it's tricky, right? So if you're looking at student performance across a school year or across a specific term within the year, or even just a unit, and you see that performance goes up, you don't actually know why it went up. It could very well be that it would have gone up even had you not done the thing that you're interested in. Without a control group, there's no way to really know. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. Hey, Brian, I'm going to send you something. Okay. You're going to love this. All right. Okay, it's in your chat. (laughs) Make your own Wordle? Click it. I did click it. Are you doing it? Um, Tell me the letters you got. Oh, yeah, I'm working on it. Hit the keyboard. What's the first word you're putting in? The first word is tweak. T-W-E-A-K. Okay. I want to see if you can get this. Now I've got break. B-R-A-K-E. I'm assuming you've been doing all this wordle craze. I have been doing some of it, but I'm not like... you, You like words with friends and stuff. Yeah. I don't like the social... The sharing of it. Yeah. Yeah. I know that they're doing it in one of my kids' classrooms. They kind of just do it during their advisory time. That's a fun little little thing. Yeah. You know, advisory time is like their homeroom. What's your next word? Break. Break. And then I got to harms. H-A-R-M-S. I'll give you a big hint. It's a science word. Ooh. You might notice it says custom wordle on the top. I see that. It really should say science wordle if I could. (laughs) Um, Radar. Ooh, radar. Radon. In five. What'd you get? Five out of six. What was the word? Radon. Radon. So to get in the craze, I thought, if I was smart enough and had the time, I would crank out a science wordle right now but i'm using this website and we'll put some links i'll send you links to put in the show notes for this where you can make your own custom wordle but what i did do is make a list of about a hundred plus science five letter science words so ah. uh, we can put that in the website and if there's somebody out there listening and they'd be like i can make a wordle that can use the word bank and everything that's great but this website will let you put one word in a day and then you can use it in class and it looks just like the normal wordle but this would be a science wordle huh that's i like that a lot i think that can be a little bit of brain teasers out there and especially for as we kind of get to you know work our way towards the end of the school year for a lot of a lot of places Cells is five letters, by the way, everyone. I got C-E-L-L-S. cells, atoms. Um, I went online and just like dunes, watts. Oh, now I'm giving people answers. Ooh, wait, wait. No free learning. Volts. Yeah. Volts. Umbra. I didn't know what Umbra was. I had to look some of these up myself, which oh. could be fun. You could do this with the class and the kids would be like, what's brain? And then search it. I like that. Yeah. So, Brian, Brian, B-R-I-N-E. Is that what you yeah. meant? Yes. Yeah. What? Yeah. I think yeah, you said like, salt. What's Brian? I'm like, I'm, I'm right here. I'm, I'm me. <laughs> Salts. If yeah. you think any, think of any more, we'll put it on the, I'll put the list on the website, maybe as like a Google doc that people can copy and then you can add to it. And then you can use this auto word, um, wordle generator. There's two of them, um, that I found that you can make your own custom word and then put that out there and have your science wordle of the day. Sound nice. good. I like this it. could be a good activity. Maybe it's how you start uh, the day in your class, kind of 
get the students thinking, get them、uh, ready to learn. At least that's what we think could happen. I suspect our guest today would see things a little bit differently. As someone who studies learning, before I get to make a claim that this could improve learning, we're going to need someone like her to do the learning research. I'm、uh, Megan Samaraki. I have a PhD in cognitive psychology. I earned that degree at Purdue University、uh, a handful of years ago. And as a cognitive psychologist, I'm really interested in how people process information, what goes on in our minds, and specifically, my research area is focused on learning and memory. And I like to take that research and apply it to educational settings. So the classroom, students learning independently on their own, maybe studying, or if they're trying to learn something new just for fun. But also other contexts work really well too, like the State Department when foreign service individuals need to go overseas and learn a new language, or、um, organizations where people、uh-huh. need to learn some form of new training. I did a podcast、um, with a, a guy who was interested in how to learn new sort of aspects of technology. He was in sort of secure technology security. So、uh-huh. I think it can be applied in a lot of ways, but of course my my primary focus and passion is helping students in K through twelve, university and and upward. Sure. So you have been contacted by the State Department, is what I get out of that. <laughs> yeah. Do you have to have、yeah. some special clearance for that? <laughs> no, Hold for the、no. State Department. <laughs> no, we did a workshop with、uh, instructors for the、um, for I think it was called the for,、uh, Foreign Service Institute.、Um, oh wow! FSI. Yeah, it was really neat because they those instructors teach the Foreign Service Institute individuals any number of things.、Um, a common one is foreign language, and so we talked with them about how to implement effective and efficient learning strategies in courses that might be only a day, all the way to courses that are much longer, and how individuals can kind of keep keep up with what they need to know while they're at their post. Ah, now you mentioned podcast just a little bit before, and that's how I first heard your voice. You're on my phone in my playlist. Can you tell us about your podcast? Yeah, yeah, the Learning Scientist podcast. So the podcast started after the website started, and the website started after the Twitter account. So I probably should start at the beginning. Ah,、oh, yeah.、Um, a, a colleague of mine,、uh, Yana Weinstein, who is no longer with our group, but、uh, she and I were、um, on Twitter. I was there because I was trying to create a new assignment for my students to try to connect. Cognitive science to the real world in some way, and so I was playing around with Twitter for the assignment, and she was on there just tweeting at students, telling them how to study, and a lot of them were like, "Who are you? What are you doing?" and、oh, wow. go away.、Um, <laughs> and, and I, I saw her and was like, "What's up?" And、um, she and I knew each other from Washington University in St. Louis. That's where I did my master's, and she was a postdoc there. And、um, we started talking, and she was saying she was just really frustrated that we were doing all of this research, and it takes forever, publishing in journals, and then it never goes anywhere. And our field、sure. is just really bad about communicating with educators, and and especially by directional communication.、Um, a lot of us like to sort of say, "Here's what you should do," and then just sort of drop the mic and walk away.、Um, so. <laughs> So she was just really frustrated and and said we need to do more and I was excited about that、um, and so we kept kind of playing around on Twitter and at some point my now husband at the time I'm not even sure we were engaged yet but he said you know you really can't just tweet you should have a website and a blog、yeah. and and then it turned into downloadable materials and、um, eventually a podcast and how so, long has、um, that been since the first tweet I guess. Oh,、um, let's or, see. Or how long has you been doing the podcast, for example? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm having to dig deep.、Yeah. Um, the the Twitter the Twitter account started in January of 2016. Okay. And I believe, actually, you know what? I remember the podcast. The first episode aired in late 2017.、Um, and I remember because we were recording the first episodes before my wedding, which was in 2017, <laughs> but they were coming out after the wedding. And so I had to keep remembering to use my、um, my new、oh, name. Oh, sure. 
And I, I switched it because my maiden name was Smith. And as you can imagine, Megan Smith caused all kinds of problems for me. Yeah, <laughs> so sure. the new name is much better. Yeah. I actually had to make up a, like a fake account today for training purposes, <laughs> and I used Sue Smith as the. I was trying to th- you know be generic, and then I um I used this person this person doesn't exist dot com to create a fake like avatar. So it was a uh, Sue Smith. So well, uh, she does. Samaraki is aunt. more is definitely more distinct. <laughs> it's your aunt. <laughs> that is my aunt. Yeah. It's probably a lot of people's aunts. It's probably right, kind yeah, of yeah, right. Totally. Right. Person definitely exists. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the point of getting research into teachers' hands. I think that has been a perennial problem. We often get some research disseminated to us within educator training programs, but then it drops off pretty precipitously. I think we find that, first of all, as educators, it's really hard to to get access to uh, research-based methodology unless you are actively seeking it out. Maybe you're in a master's program or you're... Um, you've subscribed to journals that may have it there. But beyond that, um, I see that as a, a as a disconnect once teachers get into the classroom away from, uh, I guess, from their own learning. Yeah, there's some serious barriers. Um, if, if it makes you feel better, there was a point at which I had to request that the Rhode Island College Library, which is where I'm a, an associate professor, um, that they give me access to my own article. Um, I had another copy. It doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's one of those things, right? So uh, there are a lot of um, access issues. So, I mean, first and foremost, you mentioned subscribing to journals. That's not free. No, no, by no means. We don't pay our teachers enough as it is. So <laughs> to subscribe to these journals, I think, is just unreasonable. And the cost is quite high. Um, and, you know, I have access to my library system within um, my college. And, uh, you know, if someone was in the master's program, that's how they would access it because they'd have that that library connection. But if not, mm-hmm. where are they supposed to get this? Yeah. And it's difficult for researchers. There's been a push to publish in open access journals, but there are issues with that, too. And I won't go into Absolutely. I won't go into it in depth, but. In order to publish in open access journals, you actually have to pay a publication fee, and that fee tends to be very high. So people Mm -hmm. with grant money can get away with paying for those publication fees, although I don't know if that's the best use of our federal grant money, but, you know, that's sort of a separate issue. All right. But, yeah, access is just a huge issue. And then even once you get your hands on one of those articles, they're written primarily for us. There's a lot of very specific methodology that is essential if you're trying to replicate a study and it's essential for the peer review process. And so we need it in order for this process to be rigorous, Mm -hmm. but it just bogs people down. I was in my graduate program for five years. I did the first two at Washington University in St. Louis and the last three at Purdue. And many people are in the program for six years or longer. And that's full time, not having a separate job. That was all I was doing was just that and a teaching and research assistantship. And I I learned how to read these articles and and scrutinize them. But you can't expect teachers who have a whole different job that they've had to train for and do to then also do my job. Right. That's right. ridiculous. Exactly. Especially yeah. the elementary teacher that's trapped in like a, you know, they're, they're trapped in supervision as most of their day um, with teaching in the middle of all that. So, mm-hmm. you know, a secondary teacher may have some time in the middle of their day, but uh, even then time is not, is usually reserved for grading and prepping. Right. Yeah. It's, it's more than a full-time job, and my job is more than a full-time job. Um, I do more than just teaching, even though my teaching schedule is lighter than um, that of a K-12 through teacher. There's a lot of other stuff that we have to do. Absolutely. Um, my students are often really shocked. Um, but so, yeah, we, we're all pressed for time. And so sure. I think rather than trying to figure out how we can all do more with less, it's better to just talk to each other. And and this is where bi-directional communication is really essential. And I know that teachers have had professional development sessions for ages, but it seems to me, and this is maybe a biased perspective, but it seems to me that a lot of the individuals running professional development sessions are not researchers either. They're sort of this, this middle person. And 
I'm sure that there is value for that middle person. And a lot of the middle people are really great. But if the researchers aren't communicating with these other groups, then some things can get lost in Mm -hmm. translation. And institutions of higher education don't always value this type of outreach work, especially at Research One institutions. So the top institutions that have a lot of federal grant money coming in, if you're doing something other than writing a grant or writing a paper, then you're losing money. I'm lucky Uh because Rhode Island College values teaching and values research with students in particular. And so they see this outreach work that I do as valuable scholarship. And I think more and more institutions of higher education are going to start valuing this because we just what is the point of doing all of this if we're all just talking to each other in an ivory tower? Yes, I I have so much to say about this, but I think we should back up. I kind of want to do how a bill becomes a law sort of thing when it comes to education research. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick my favorite topic, the one that drew me into your podcast, which is seductive details. I loved that topic. Um, can you tell us first? He was just buzzing little, about it after. Oh my gosh! You're hearing it, and, 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 so and we do PD, it became, so it was kind of yep. nice to. It was kind of nice because, especially uh, Brian and I are both in technology integration. We're sometimes those middle people that you're talking about. Y- yes, um, but we're trying. <laughs> we're trying to. <laughs> well, we're trying, and sometimes we use the term best practice with the best intent, and sometimes we have research-based kind of backing with it. So I'm wondering if you could first give us a real quick description of seductive details and what we've learned about it and then um we can kind of walk us through like how it is studied um and how you get the result you know how you get results is it observed in a classroom is it you know those kinds of things can you, would you be able to do that like start with the seductive detail part yeah yeah that sounds great so so the seductive details the idea behind this and i don't remember what the exact focus was of that podcast episode because i think it was carolina that recorded it i mean of course i listened to it but Uh um the concept of seductive details really just has to do with these extraneous details that might be present when a student is trying to learn so humor is often cited as sort of a seductive detail is this kind of along the lines of what you were thinking? Yes. Like yeah. I, I would put a comic in a, in a test. Yeah. Yeah. So these extra things like a joke or um, an image on, on the screen or um, even some people might broaden the definition to talk about decorations in the classroom. Yep. Mm-hmm. Those types of things. Um, We think if it draws our attention to the thing that we're trying to learn, that maybe that will help improve learning. And we also would love to think that it improves our mood. A comic makes us happy. And if we're happy, then we're going to learn better. If we enjoy the activity, we might say that we're learning it better. And and that might lead us to think just sort of anecdotally, oh, these things are really good. Let's include them. Uh-huh. A better smelling room with an oil diffuser. Is that is that along the line, too? <laughs> that's um, a whole nother realm. <laughs> yeah, that's a different. That, I don't know if I'd call that a seductive detail. That's almost more of like a the, instituting some sort of context, but okay, um, anyway. a context cue of some sort. But really, this is an empirical question. What I mean by that is it's a question that we can ask and we can collect data and we can collect data that is of high, really high quality, or we can collect data that's of really low quality, but uh, we could collect data to try to answer this question. And so, so we want to know, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry to cut you out. But so, for example, if I, in my physics class, if I was maybe trying to go through a few slides to reiterate the difference between a series and parallel circuit, and then in between there, I slipped in a far side comic about, um, you know, the kid doing uh, making a circuit as sort of a ha ha mm-hmm. that would brain be brain break right? we might say mm, it was more of just i put it in there because i thought it was funny and it was related okay yeah that's that, 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 is that would be class, it right yeah that's a classic example so let's go with that if we put comics in how, uh-huh. how that uh, that are related how does that affect our ability to learn and remember so as a cognitive psychologist I'm going to want to start my research at a very basic level. And we call this the lab to classroom model. And when I'm starting at the very basic level, I'm starting at at, um, the basic research. 
cognitive psychologists have a bad reputation for doing a lot of basic research and, you know, being very simple with our materials and creating these contrived situations. And to some extent, that's really true. We we do like to start at that place. But the reason is it allows us to control so many aspects of the experiment. And with that control, we gain the ability to determine cause and effect relationships. And that's really what we're after. We want to know what is causing learning or impairing learning compared to a control. So what I might do in that case is I might have a group of students. Usually it's it's college students who are taking intro psych. But in the United States, that's almost every college student. Um, okay. They happen to be typically around 18 or 19, but, you know, there's, di- you know, differing, differing ages. But that part doesn't really matter so much because we're not yet to the generalizability piece. What I'm going to do is I might have them learn foreign language word pairs. Uh, we like Swahili in cognitive psychology because Swahili looks enough like English that you can kind of sound it out. But most students don't know Swahili coming in. If we used Spanish or French, we would be really worried that, you know, the students would already know it. And so Another we're not really measuring learning. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Sure. OK, so we're going to use Swahili English pairs and then we're just going to throw some of those comics in between. And maybe the comic has is related to, you know, so Wingu is cloud in Swahili. And that that's like one of the only ones I know. Yeah. But uh, Wingu is cloud and maybe the comic has to do with a cloud. I don't know. The sure. connection isn't as clear as we want it to be. It's not the same as that physics example, which is really rich. But we can control a lot of aspects of this in, of this experiment. And we would look to see how well do the individuals in the experiment then remember those pairs in Uh a condition where they had the comics and in a condition where they didn't. Okay. We can't just stop there and then say, okay, great. Use comics. Don't use comics in the classroom. We, we can't, we can't just make that leap yet. The next step would be to try to take those physics examples. But would there be a, I'm sorry, would there be a, um, a paper or out of that at that point though? Yeah. Okay. Probably a few. few, We would probably do this a bunch of times. Sure. Um, Which, again, is why just subscribing to a journal and trying to read a journal is not going to get you very far because you're going to just be reading these like very kind of focused. You might get to the end of it and be like, great, but I now I need to read 10 more papers in order to figure out what's going on with this one thing. It's just too much. I think it might be the opposite. You'd be like, oh, there confirmation bias because maybe you thought it was that way and you'd you'd Mm. get one one research paper that you could get your hands on and say bum research shows now off to my staff development (laughs) yeah that's true that might happen if you're if you're you know a really rigorous empiricist you would want to search more and more and more you'd be trying to refute your own opinion and you would keep right. searching and reading until you were like look there's so much evidence suggesting that this is correct that i'm just going to stop but yeah you're right that could that could be a problem although i think a lot of teachers would look at swahili english word pairs and yeah. probably not even read the rest of it they'd balk and be like, perhaps <laughs> that's true that's true and that's fair Yeah. So we might then take um, in the lab, in this applied lab level. So now we're kind of moving up. um, We we might, you know, work with um, work with the two of you or other teachers to try to create materials and still in the lab so that we can control things because we don't want it to be that the students in the control group aren't paying attention to learning at all. And maybe that's you know, why the comic is good. That could be its own variable, but we have to control everything. So we bring them still into the lab and we use these complex materials and we add the comic in versus keep the comic out. And we would try to change a whole bunch of things to get at the underlying cause. Why is it that these seductive details are in in many cases, they hurt learning. They, they detract in some cases they they don't really improve learning. They don't really hurt anything. You sometimes they remember the seductive detail better than the actual material, but that doesn't yeah. mean that that doesn't mean that they would remember the actual material better if the comic wasn't there. It sort of depends. Um, but where do you get like like if you worked with us, then you'd get some like maybe high school students or middle school students. 
yeah, we could do that in the lab, but usually we wait. So we, we do it okay. in this applied set, setting just to make sure it still works with this is this is the other thing. There's papers coming out of all of this. It's taking forever, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're, you guys are like, when do we get into the classroom? I'm like, oh, we're not there yet. So you do it in the applied <laughs> this applied level in the lab to keep controlling things and you're writing papers and you keep doing it. And then when you finally are like, you know what, this is working pretty well. We have a good idea of what's causing learning or um, inhibiting uh, learning. And so we are going to move into the classroom. And this is where we are working with teachers to Uh alter their instruction. And oftentimes we do this in a within subjects way. What that basically means is that all of the students participate in the experimental condition and the control. It's just a way to kind of make things a little bit more equitable. We would just switch which types of materials and and mm. flop it across classrooms. But now we're getting to where you're asking, where we would work with you and okay. we would work with your teachers and we would alter the instruction in the classroom to see how it actually affected student outcome. So prior to all of that, though, it, the testing would not be done on students, um, let's say, at the K-12 age. Typically not, and the and unless you're working in a developmental lab, and and part of the reason for that is that it costs a lot of money to go into a classroom and do that type of research. We also don't want to. I mean, imagine if I said, "Hey, I've got this thing that I've been testing for a little while. Do you want me to disrupt your yeah. class?" And <laughs> I mean, that we want to be pretty confident. I mean, it, it, it's. We can never be fully confident until we go into the classroom, but we want to be as close as possible before we start taking okay. up valuable time. Sure. Okay. Does it get a little bit tricky when you're going into a classroom? And I can think of my instructional style and my content delivery as, as very personal. Um, I'm sure you you probably get to a point where um, people get defensive about <laughs> what they're doing and, and why, you know, why it may not be as effective as they think in their head. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it depends. Um, there can be a lot of defensiveness, and, and I think we have to try to remove ourselves from that, both teachers and researchers. Researchers get attached to the ideas that they publish in their papers. We're not supposed to, but, but it's human, human nature. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and teachers do too. Uh, the memory I have when I was in graduate school at Purdue, I did some research with fourth graders in a school um, down in Indianapolis. And what I remember most is that there was this one teacher who was so excited about the research and just wanted to learn about research methods and how to conduct it. And she she was great. We were like, you should join the lab and get your Ph.D. She was like, I might I might get my Ph.D. So um, I remember that. And it was a, a really positive experience. Uh, but I, I mean, I imagine it could be difficult. I I doubt teachers who are uninterested in this completely would be participating in this type of thing unless it was somehow mandated um, at the school level. Um, But yeah, I mean, yeah, you don't get a lot of people saying, tell me what I'm doing wrong all the time. (laughs) Right. We also don't really want the teachers to know exactly what's going on with the experimental manipulation, because if the teachers, I mean, imagine if a teacher is really defensive, they might, Im- implicitly with, without realizing it sort of bias the students to try to learn the stuff maybe that's in the control group or something sure. or if they're really excited about the research they might bias things towards the material that was in the experimental group and so we really just want them to not be overly aware not because we don't trust them but it, it's just like the reason you do double blind research in clinical trials you don't want the nurses and the doctors and the patients to know if they got the drug or the placebo because that could affect the mm-hmm. result so we do the best we can but by the time we get into the classroom things are a little bit messy and um, we lose a little bit of our ability to determine cause and effect control is not is not always there. The control group is not always perfect, but we do the very best we can. And then when we can look at a concept from the very basic level all the way up to the classroom level, both of them have their pros and cons, and those pros and cons sort of complement one another. Mm. So in the terms of the seductive detail, can we say that that research made it all the way to the classroom and had you know several um, peer reviews on uh, at that level? That's one that I'm not positive about. I know that there has been applied research on it in the lab, and I want to say that some researchers have done work 
because, of course, most researchers, a lot of researchers are teaching their own classes, too. And so you can kind of you can kind of go in and manipulate things in your own classroom as long as you have the appropriate um, institutional review board so the ethics approval. Uh, but I know that they've IRB. done it in. Yeah, yeah. I know they've done it in their own classrooms. I don't know if it's been done at the K through 12 level. I'd have to look. Hmm. I can't remember. I, I it was because you did two podcasts on it. One was sort of like a big, broad one, and then you did some of these little bite-sized episodes where you kind of take like, in yeah, uh, a particular idea. And I really like those too because it's you know depending on how long the walk I have, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I can you know kind of adjust for those. And so it's kind of neat to see those. That that's that is like exactly what I wanted to. Um, I didn't fully understand, and I think. What is, um, I don't know if it was a surprise, it's just kind of hearing it out loud now. The idea that a lot of these experiments, in essence, or the research, is done in a lab. It's done on adults, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It has to be done on adults first. And it takes a while for it to get to, um, if we're going to make any assumptions about, like, you know, elementary school age or something like that. Yeah, and and much of the research um, that that we do, the the four of us and the learning scientists, so um, Cindy Nebel is at Vanderbilt University, uh, Dr. Carolina Cooper Tetzel is at um, University of Glasgow in Scotland, and mm-hmm. Althea Nikominsky at St. Bonaventure University. What we mostly do is research on retrieval practice, spacing, sometimes elaboration, dual coding, some of those ideas, and and other oh, yeah, other no student learning topics, and. Mm-hmm. That research has been studied at all of the different levels. I mean, retrieval practice, the first paper that I've been able to find is from 1909. This is uh-huh. not new. Um, and and so, yeah, a lot of the research has been done with adults. But what we typically find is that kids are not fundamentally processing the information while they're learning in a completely different way. They're not a different species. Um, there certainly are major differences um, mm-hmm. developmentally, but but the way they learn tends to be pretty similar. What needs to happen is often the activity needs to be adjusted to be appropriate uh, with with the younger kids. Oh, okay. See, I would think that there would be some because of the the, the that the developmental part would get in the way so much. But I kind of see what you're saying now. That yeah, and I mean, if I'm you sure. understand how learning takes place, then you can adjust for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, attention issues might be a bit different, and there are certainly differences in terms of the way, the way a younger child's the, the classroom is set up, and the way um, the things go in the classroom compared to mm-hmm. university students. But it's not. It's not so far off that we have to basically start over when we're talking about younger kids. We'll be right back. Each year, the 3M Young Scientist Challenge recognizes a grand prize winner, 10 finalists, the Improving Lives Award winner, and up to 50 state merit winners nationwide who have demonstrated a passion for solving everyday problems to improve the world around them. To enter, students in grades 5 through 8 will share an original idea that helps solve an everyday problem in their community. They are invited to submit their solution in the form of a 1-2 to two minute video explaining the science behind it. It only takes an idea and a one to two minute video to get started. Learn more and enter at youngscientistlab.com. And now back to the show. Megan, you mentioned obviously it takes time to do this research and then get back into the classroom and maybe into application. I'm I'm thinking of technology as a as a perhaps a double edged sword there because we don't have a lot of literature on technology and learning yet we've really pushed a lot of technology into student hands um, but is that also a silver lining that we can use technology to collect data without uh, without student knowledge of that I think so I mean I think what's important is that um, that we make sure we have the appropriate controls so. 
I there's there's a lot of different types of research. What I do is mostly experimental work. Some some of it, of course, um, we can't manipulate. So, you know, if I'm interested in how a student's locus of control affects their learning, so you know, how how much they attribute their successes and failures to things that are um, internal to them or things that are external to them. So I failed the test because the teacher is awful versus I failed the test because I didn't study or I did really well and it's partially because I got good sleep. That well, Those types of things would be internal, sure. whereas it's the teacher's fault, someone else's fault, something else's fault if it's external. Um, and so, you know, if I'm interested in that and how that affects learning, I can't manipulate that. <laughs> it's an individual difference. Um, and so that that isn't purely experimental work, but there's all kinds of different research methods and there's value in all of it, but they all have pros and cons. So, you know, if we're just looking at how students in a classroom use some tool and this, I think this happens a lot. We might look to see how often the student engages with the tool, maybe when they're at home, and we might look to see, you know, how they're using the tool. And then we look to see how they perform on a test. That's, That's not experimental research. That does not allow us to determine cause and effect relationships. We don't have a control group there. We don't know really what's going on. And we could maybe look at older test scores from other groups, but that's a different group of people and they didn't have random assignment. Mm. And so I think we have to be really careful about drawing too many conclusions in that context. It certainly doesn't mean that there's no value in that work. It's more descriptive, um, but it, and it might spark ideas about what we need to do in the experimental lab, or it might, I mean, it, it might help you understand sort of the practicality of something. And if you've already linked up what the tool is doing to some experimental work in another context, then perhaps experimental work on that specific tool isn't needed, right? So if a tool yeah. is using retrieval practice, we don't need to know if that specific, what that specific tool is doing necessarily. Retrieval practice tends to work pretty well. So descriptive in that context might be just fine. Mm -hmm. We just have to be really knowledgeable, I think, about what type of evidence we have, what the pros of that evidence are, and then what the cons of the evidence is, and then try to balance that, make an mm -hmm. informed decision. I, I'm glad you bring that up because I think we see a lot of times there's been a there's been a push for teachers to be using data to make decisions. Uh, there's going to be a collective groan if you listen carefully from our audience that when I say data di data driven decision making is, is a big thing mm -hmm. in education. <laughs> I I get a little bit worried that um, we're not. <laughs> Again, as you mentioned, these are these are maybe descriptive events or anecdotal observations, things like that, where they may I mean, every, anyone can make a graph from data. But uh, does that mean it's actually valid or worthwhile? And you're saying a little bit. Can you can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, it's tricky, right? So if you're looking at student performance across a school year or across a specific term within the year, or even just a unit, and you see that performance goes up, you don't actually know why it went up. It could very well be that it would have gone up even had you not done the thing that you're interested in. Without a control group, there's no way to really know. That's not to say that you can't learn something, but probably what makes more sense is looking to the learning science sciences and understanding what principles have evidence behind them and experimental evidence that has been, you know, peer reviewed and all of that and, and try to link those things up with the things that you're doing in the classroom and then look to see, OK, is performance increasing um, and, and does that make sense given what I know from learning science? Um, but we also have to be really careful about um, sort of what data within the classroom we're looking at. So one example is, um, and th you'll like this because it's um, it's an experiment done with younger kids. So uh, Taylor and Rohr, or Rohr and Taylor, I'm not sure which order this paper is, but in 2007 or 8-ish, they uh -huh. published a paper mm -hmm. on interleaving. And interleaving is this idea that if you mix up or jumble up different concepts or problems, 
that you'll learn better than if you block them. And if you think about a standard math classroom, at least all of the math classrooms that I've been in, both when I was in school and I substitute taught for a little while there in college, what I tended to see and what we what I think is typical to see is, you know, you do all of the addition problems and you do all of the subtraction problems. If they're blocked mm-hmm. like that. Taylor and Rohr were interested in looking at this idea of jumbling them up. So they had they were fourth grade students. They were 10 years old learning these different formulas with shapes. So some of the formulas were to figure out how many corners there were, how many faces, how many edges, uh, you know, those types of things. Some of the kids learned in a blocked way. They did all one type of problem and then they did all another type of problem. Some of the kids had it mixed up. And during practice, the kids who had blocked practice were at 100% by the end of it. And they were doing really well pretty much the whole time. Mm -hmm. Whereas the kids that were interleaving were closer to about 80%. So if you stopped there, if you looked at it, and this is this is a controlled experiment, if you uh-huh. stopped there, you would we only come do to addition, the conclusion, and then we do subtraction. Right, <laughs> you'd come to the conclusion that blocking is better, and I I think you would say, look, they've mastered it. You give them a test the next day. The kids that were getting a hundred percent now are getting thirty-seven, I think, percent. The kids that were getting eighty percent are now getting about seventy-six. Hmm. And so what what is producing difficulties during learning is producing more durable learning in the I'm going to say long run. But I don't think most teachers think of one day as even that long, yeah. but, but it is the next day. And so I think we have to be careful if if you have teachers that are looking at performance during learning and it looks great, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be durable. Oftentimes, the things that are a bit more difficult and lead us to make mistakes and and that might feel like a struggle, those things often produce more durable learning in the long run. So retrieval practice and spacing are the same way. It feels really difficult. And if you ask students how they're doing when they are spacing, interleaving, retrieval practice, they will say they're learning less than yeah. if they're repeatedly reading or blocking. But there's a disconnect between their metacognitive judgment, so how they're how they think that they're doing and how they're actually doing in the long run. And so I, I do think we have to be careful. Yeah. About does the it type help of data to, we're looking at? I was gonna ask, does it help to tell students that um, oh, gosh. you know, that discomfort you're feeling? Well, we're we're doing it for a reason. That you know, we know that it that you'll, you know, that you remember, you'll, you'll get that 78%. But being yeah, careful so, not to call it grit or something else uh, fancy like oh, that. Oh, grit. Yes. So um, this is another empirical question. <laughs> so you can tell you're talking to a researcher. You know, I what? love it. I love it. Because, you know, our audience is science teachers. So everything, every question we ask, you basically start designing a little experiment for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is an empirical question. And it's one that's very difficult to study. Um, what what method of teaching and it gets really meta. So so what uh-huh. method of teaching students about learning strategies leads them to learn the learning strategy and then endorse the learning strategy such that it then produces educational outcomes that are positive? Yeah. So you're wow. How do you learn about learning and then apply what you've learned while you're learning something else? It's like an it's educational chimera here. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've tried to do some research on this. Again, this is with college students, um, but first year seminar college students. How, you know, how do we teach them about learning strategies, get them to believe that the learning strategies work, use them, and then does that lead to improvements in their overall grades? It's it's very difficult to do, but I think that that's the direction we're moving in um, in in our field. We we were pretty sure that retrieval practice works pretty well, um, not in every situation, of course. That doesn't mean that it's perfect, but it, it works pretty well. And we know that it tends to reduce testing anxiety. It, it does a lot of good things. So when the students are uncomfortable, if they can, we know that if they can work through that, eventually they will feel better and they'll be sort of like, come on, bring on the test. I'm good. And, you know, like a tests confidence aren't booster. going away. Mm-hmm. Tests aren't going away. But, but 
you know, how to get students to do that on their own is is a much more difficult question. It is something I have a, a couple projects open um, related to this, but, um, you know, research is really slow and life has been kind of hectic, yeah. I, I must say. <laughs> yeah, for that sure. That makes me think of when we've we had, again, like we testing is here to stay. A few years ago, I remember one of our schools had this, again, someone probably had a snippet of research saying that, uh, crunching peppermint or crunching spearmint mm-hmm. in your mouth was <laughs> a, a better. Me- I know I could hear your groan there, so I'll, I'll just serve it up to you. But you know, have has better memory recall. So lo and behold, every child had uh, one of these lifesavers as They're they were still taking doing the test. That, Brian, yep, still I know. Doing that, and it's it's fascinating. And and maybe if we convince one or two kids that that's happening, that's that's fine. But I wonder about the other effects, like. When they get their test scores back, like, well, I had two lifesavers and I didn't do any better. <laughs> um, is is there danger in that? I mean, how do they know how well they would have performed without the lifesaver? I mean, this is the thing. <laughs> without a control group, you don't really know. And I, I, I've heard of this before, and I can, I could think of reasons why maybe having something to crunch on might be helpful. Probably not so much to do with any sort of cognitive learning thing, but more just if it, if it almost like fidget spinners, if it allows them to just sort of kind of get some of that anxiety out and get some of that, um, you know, kind of put some of their attention elsewhere and lets them just go through the test or maybe even a placebo effect. They, they feel more confident. I mean, those, there could be ways that it's valuable. Uh, There is some research about sort of, um, reinstating a context when you learn something versus when you um, when you test on it and how reinstating that context can sometimes help. So I've done some wild experiments where they had, you know, people learn a list of words. So we're at that basic level, a list mm-hmm. of words either on land or underwater in these are like scuba divers. And then they have to test on the words either on land or underwater and the connection the if you reinstate the context. So if you learned on land, you test better on land. If you learned underwater, you test better underwater. They've done this in different rooms. They've done it with alcohol, with marijuana. Reinstating the context seems to sometimes help, but, but this doesn't mean that like just matching, like kids need to sit in the same seat or else they won't learn and remember or that they have to be chewing peppermint when they learn. And then when they test, I more so these effects are pretty fragile and they tend to work really well when there's some way that they can link what they're learning to the context, some sort of cue. Um, but I, I think it would be better if we took this research really seriously, it would be better to just have them learn in all different places to try to make it so that there's not really context associations, right? Cause that's what mm-hmm. we want. We don't mm-hmm. want students to only remember what they're learning when they're sitting with the teacher and what we learn does tend to be context dependent in that way. And then when they move on to the next teacher, it's like, it's out the window. I remember when I realized, and it was pretty late in my life when I realized that what I was learning in math class and what I was learning in physics class, like should have connected for me. And I was <laughs> like, wow, really? I just sort of figured, you know, physics, math, two separate things. And I think that's true of a lot. I, I hear my students all the time say, you know, well, that's that's not what what um, what Dr. Dotlow wants for our papers. You know, she likes this type of citation. But what type of citation do you want? And I'm like uh-huh. APA format. It's all the same. Uh-huh. But they struggle to transfer from one class to the other. And I think it's because what we learn does tend to be contextualized. And so trying to break those cues in context might be better. But but it it's not so, so contextualized that if you're sitting in a different seat, you'll now have no access to those memories. Do you see what I'm saying? There's yeah, kind of a, sure. So you sure. either eliminate your seductive details or overwhelm them constantly with seductive <laughs> details. No, I mean, <laughs> there, there's so many things there because with seductive details, if. It's a different situation if, if we are controlling it such that we know the individual is is attending to the material equally in both conditions. It's just whether or not that seductive detail is there, Mm -hmm. then the seductive detail probably isn't going to do anything or might hurt. But at the same time, 
you know, we, the learning scientists group, we've created some videos to teach about the strategies. And when we created those videos, the goal was to try to make them really cheesy and kind of grab attention because the, they were supposed to be for people surfing YouTube. All of and social media is doing that, right? Right. Mm-hmm. If you don't grab their attention, they're not going to engage at all. And therefore, learning's uh-huh. not going to happen if you're not there, right? Um, you're not going to learn uh, something from class if you're not in class. And so, you know, if the comic is the only way to get the kids to come to class, then sure, it might indirectly lead to learning. But Steer you into the seduced part of the seductive detail. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so th- there's a lot of things there. Um, on the flip side, though, that both of the po- um, your discussions on that made me think about: Am I putting these things in my lesson? Who am I putting them in the lesson for? And admittedly, sometimes it was for me. Um, I did it for my, you know, I did it for myself. I think, and you start to really ask a question: Wait, now, did I put this in here for learning or? You know, and and so I think mission accomplished for that, that, that (laughs) aspect, because it gets you to think about why, why am I teaching what I'm teaching and how, you know, mm -hmm. why am I teaching it this way? And I would say if, if putting it in there rejuvenates you and makes you a better instructor, maybe it does increase learning. There's so many variables here. And this is why we have to start in the lab. Because in the lab, we can uh, control for all of these things and isolate which things are leading to learning, which things are neutral, and which things are harming learning. Uh If we're doing it all in the classroom from the beginning, all we can really say is when things are exactly like this, here's what happens compared to when things are exactly like that. It's much harder to isolate every single variable in the classroom. Another thing that was coming to mind um, as I prepared for this podcast is the idea that research, I guess I feel like some people or many people are cheating, um, not researchers, but in educa- in the education world. I think if you popped open a couple s- school board meetings and listened to uh, just, you know, listen for research being used, I wonder if kind of like what you talked about, like you collected some data, but you didn't go far enough, but this is the result you wanted. So you ran with that. Um, is that a, a problem that kind of plagues your field? I mean, I think that confirmation bias is, is a problem in our society. <laughs> this is not a problem just within schools. We there, There's so much misinformation out there. All you have to do is Google for the thing you want. The thing pops up. I, the algorithms on social media shows you what you want to see. I mean, it's bad. Uh-huh. Internet was The internet was supposed to be the great equalizer, and I think it's really created a lot of a lot of good, but a lot of problems. Um, I, I think research is often used in the context of any time I collect data, and data can be whatever I want it to be. Yeah. Data can be an anecdote, and that is that is troubling. Um, when I'm teaching research methods at the undergraduate level, I, we have to talk a lot about the difference between empirical data that is sound and just collecting a handful of anecdotes. There's also a um, a, a misconception. Well, I don't even want to say a misconception, but sometimes when people say research, they mean like searching the internet. Yeah. Oh, we, we've, mean, we've talked about that on this podcast. Like people don't even know what research is anymore. Do your right. own research. And I did, my kids will say that I researched this. I'm like, you watched some YouTube videos. Not the same. <laughs> yeah, my mom used to always say to us, look it up. We had all these encyclopedias and she'd say, look it up. And I like yeah. that term. You looked it up, but you didn't yeah. conduct research. Um, and some people will call it like a research paper is reading peer, you know, research articles and then writing about those. And that I mean, that's not a bad thing either, but it's not the same as engaging in empirical research. The difference between a primary source, a secondary source, it's tricky. And I think it's um it's something that is difficult. One of the things I think back when I was younger, like fourth, fifth grade, and we were learning about all of this, I don't think I really got it, to be honest with you. And I think, you know, as time goes on, I understand this, this, uh, well, obviously, I have my PhD in it. So I should hope that I understand it. But, (laughs) but as time went on, I grasped it more. And I think what sometimes happens when we teach is that um, there's this curse of knowledge where we are expert. And so when we say something or we use the term, we just know what it means. We might explain it a little bit, but 
it's difficult to understand how the person receiving it actually interprets it. Is that does that make sense? No, that, that makes sense. The mm-hmm. individual, the individual who's more novice, tends to focus on more surface details. So uh-huh. I might be doing research and I use the internet. And so t- because I use the internet to collect data and a novice might say, oh, research is the internet. Therefore, uh-huh. Googling is research, right? Sure. I, I said, you can practice retrieval by writing out what you know from memory to my first year seminar students. And later on, they remembered it's the writing one. So if I copy my notes, I'm engaging in retrieval, <laughs> right? But I mean, that's a, a common mistake, a novice focusing on surface details. And so I think that's where some of this gets, gets sure. kind of bungled up. I can see that that getting twisted. The, the one thing I'm wondering also, before we let you go, is like science has some, you know, as science teachers, there are some settled science things that we talk about. Certainly there's always being to study, you know, a little bit more, but you know, if we're talking about like evolution, for example, we have the, the old big broad topic is, you know, in the settled realm, I guess. Are there some, is there something particular that, you know, we still see happening in the classroom, but we have some settled um, learning research on that, that um, would say maybe that practice should be dismissed. Well, I, learning styles comes to mind. Oh, yeah, perfect. Learning styles is so <laughs> popular, and I think it's popular Still because is. it makes sense, uh-huh. kind of. It makes intuitive sense, and and we like the idea of everybody being individually different. Our society is kind of based on this idea. Um, our, in our culture, we, we like to be individuals and, um, you know, it seems like it would be good caring practice to try to tailor instruction to different types of students. And certainly students have different preferences. Uh-huh. And so, you know, I used to, you know, well before I was in this area, I would have told you in high school that I'm an auditory learner because I uh-huh. liked listening and I liked talking. Uh, so I, I know it might not surprise you guys, but I really liked talking and listening, you know, was was my form. But sure. that doesn't mean that that's how you learn. And when we do controlled studies, it doesn't seem to matter. Everybody can learn better when we combine these modalities and certain topics tend to have styles. So imagine, you know, if my, my sister is an OBGYN, so she does, she performs surgery. If she yeah. had said, oh, I'm a, I'm a, um, a verbal <laughs> learner, so just I, you talk know, the baby out. School, I'm just going to, I'm just going to read about how to do a C-section, I'm not going to do one. And, you know, then it'll be fine because that's how I learn. Right. No, you would you would say absolutely. You are not, you know, touching my partner who is having a baby. No way. (laughs) Same with riding a bike. You try to try to teach literature without reading. Right. All of these different areas have different modalities that tend to um, tend to work well. And so the research shows that even though students have preferences, catering to those preferences does not necessarily improve learning. Now, there could be some indirect thing where if a student really hates it and therefore completely disengages, uh-huh. well, then, yeah, sure, they're probably not going to learn as well as if we catered to the preference. But what if we give you a mint? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> yeah, that learning so- style one, though, that is still really in there. Um, recently, Veritasium has done the, the YouTube channel. Veritasium did a, an excellent video on that, kind of broke it down in in that that kind of really just I feel like that's the one that should just be played during a staff meeting somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, and there are companies that make money selling learning styles oh. and inventories and so oh, it's yeah. no surprise yep. that, you know, we didn't get into push. that. I feel like <laughs> that might be a future podcast. Um yeah. I know Brian's got to go because there's the whole lot of um products that tell us that it's you know what they're doing is research based and sometimes it's their own research and and a lot of that those kinds of things but or even memory supplements i mean the, the yes so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um megan we could talk to you all day and the good news is our listeners if you want to hear more of this kind of stuff you have an entire podcast right and yeah. in so a podcast the, a website a blog 
Yeah. So if and the nice thing is, if you haven't followed the podcast yet, you got all this material that you can listen to, um, however you get podcasts. So we'll have links for all of that in the show notes. Megan, thank you so much for talking to us today. Yeah. Thank you. This was super fun. I loved it. Thank you so much. Thanks much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lab Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about some of the things discussed in this episode or previous episodes, you can find show notes at our website, laboutloud.com. If you have a guest idea or a future topic that you'd like to see on Lab Out Loud, go to our contact page and send us a message. Also, you can subscribe to Lab Out Loud on your favorite podcasting app, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to find podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and rating. Your input helps others find our show. Thanks again for listening.